Okay, so we're going to start off by turning on the camera. We're going to start off by. Uh, we don't we take this too seriously. So we're going to thank our sponsors today. So first, thank you to Liz and to Josh Gordon, who are sponsoring the shirts to commemorate the yard site of Liz's mother, Yuta Bas Yishaya Halevi. When's actually the yard site? Today. So Shom Shalom and Aliyah from the Rubies and from. Uh, Torah, so thank you indeed. And also, <coughs> we're going to thank uh, Gloria. So thank you, Gloria. I'm looking at the camera now because she told me she's going <laughs> to. So it's, it's, yeah, it's this training that you have to talk to a camera as if you're talking to uh, dozens of people. Right? <laughs> Gloria Furstenberg, who's sponsoring to commemorate the, the fourth yard side of Adam. Adam Furstenberg, Adam Gabriel Ben Chaim Berifka, Livracha. So we do thank you, Gloria. And Shama should have an Aliyah. Page 324. Parashat Va'era. Now, the Parashat Va'era has in it uh, the, 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 the beginning of the communication from the Almighty to Moshe Rabbeinu about the process of redemption, and therefore in the past we talked about the stages of redemption that are introduced in the beginning of the parasha. Right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. These are the stages that really have created uh, the, the formula for our Haggadah, for the Leila Seder, therefore we discussed in the past those four stages. Later in the parasha we have seven outs of the ten makot, uh, the seven that are focused on in this week's parasha, uh, we're familiar with, but what we're going to start off with at least is a little <coughs> bit of a discussion on page 324 when Moshe really introduces himself to Pharaoh with Aaron about the abilities of the one who is sending him. Meaning, you are dealing here with the God who controls nature, the creator of nature could control nature, and therefore, as a result, don't mess with him, and tune in, and release, let these people go. Okay? So, on page 324, in verse 9, the Almighty says to Moshe, Ki daber alechem paro le'emor, you know, when paro will say to you, uh, saying, okay, you are being sent here by God Almighty, well, tznu lachem mofet, go at him, provide some kind of wonder. So then you're going to tell Aharon to take the mate, to take the staff, and you're going to cast it down, and it's going to turn into a tanin, a tanin. So many commentators say it's a snake. We obviously were a little bit uh, uncomfortable with the snake approach, because there is a word for a snake. There's a nachash. So a tanin seems to be some kind of creature, some kind of reptile. And as you mentioned, it's the croco a crocodile, which makes uh, lots of sense. Did they have them in Mexico, or you did see them? We it makes a lot any. of sense. What was that? Oh, we didn't see any. Alligator. <laughs> Alligator. Okay. It does make sense because it's Egypt, after all. And uh, there's even a verse in Yechezkel where Paro, Paro is called a tanin hagadol. Like the big, the big, big creature, and there was, if you go study a little bit of uh, the, what, the findings in Egypt, they talk about the fact that they identified <coughs> Sobek, you know, it's the god with the crocodile head. So it makes sense that if you're trying to indicate to Pharaoh that you are in control of him, and those gods that he worships are not going to be doing anything against the real god, it makes sense that we're dealing here with a larger creature with uh, some kind of crocodile. So they do it. Verse 10. They actually perform it. And what happens is, is it turns into a tanin. Paro's not impressed. So he calls his wise men. He calls his necromancer, the sorcerers. And they too, what do they do? They are able to perform the exact same thing with some kind of uh, incantations. They go ahead and they perform this magnificent show and they do the same. But then on page 326, we up it. We do something they can't. 
So what happens is, is that the staff of Aaron swallows theirs. Fine, and this is really the beginning, the beginning of the Makot, but there's an important message here. Now, often when you study uh, our tradition, it is always interesting to study our people as well. Jews are very interesting people, if you haven't noticed it. Mm -hmm. And they're complex people. Jews are very complex. Uh, there are sources that indicate that the Torah was given to the Jewish people because they desperately needed it. Because without it, boy, are we in trouble. This is, uh, these are what our truth in Talmud. So we, we have this, uh, or at least I do, an interest in studying not just the people, but different traditions. So when I talk about different traditions, it's not just how they sing slichot or we sing slichot, if they eat kitniot or they don't eat kitniot. Sometimes it is the philosophical approach that you see differences among Jewish people. And in one of the areas where you could uh, clearly sense that there are different, uh, different schools, you could talk about what we would identify as the school of complete faith and the rational school, <clears throat> right? In other words, when you go ahead and hear something that is not rational at all, <coughs> but, and, and, and to add to it, it's not in the Torah, meaning we do irrational things, let's face it, right? It's not rational to go ahead and eat for eight days straight matzah. It's not rational, let's face it. However, we are Torah Jews, and we believe in tradition, and we are linked back to Sinai, and there was an event that occurred 3,400 years ago that really gave us life. We turned into a nation as a result of that, and we've been having this incredible impact on the world since then. And I'm very proud of my eating matzah, but don't call it rational. But now, there are sometimes practices that are not in the Torah, not in the Talmud, and we see people doing them. And then we ask ourselves, should we be doing it or not? Right? These are questions. And an example among the many is like uh, after Pesach, you put your keys in the, in the Shlisel challah. You make a challah like a key, right? The different, and you ask yourself, okay, if indeed this would be mentioned in the Torah, 100% you should do it, but it's not, right? So something that shows up 150, 200 years ago, because perhaps some great rabbi, and I'm not minimizing his significant sense that it has some kind of spiritual accomplishment by doing it. Am I going to do it or not? Right? So there are different schools, right? And a lot of, believe, I, I do feel that this question, if I'm working with complete faith, or as one who wants it to be rational, uh, when it comes to things that make their appearance in science, right? Science, you know, the big challenges over the past century and a half, uh, where there are some difficulties in saying that the age of the universe is 6,000 years, right? So. There are those that are extremely disturbed. There are those that are somewhat disturbed. And there are those that are completely believe that there's no issue at all. If the Torah says that they have no issue at all. Now, by the way, with that discussion, uh, there, I always take the approach of what Rav Kook said. Rav Kook said that this question is such a, such a small question. It's absurd to him that you're making a big issue. And he says, because science changes its mind every few years. And he's right. In other words, Rav Cook was right that in the 1930s, uh, they found these uh, remains of uh, <coughs> the, these uh, pre-human sapiens. And they were 100% sure every expert scientist in the 1930s said, there's no question that we are descendants of them. And by now, no one says it. So science, Rav Cook points out, they're going to change their mind every few years. So to go ahead and get all disturbed. All you got to do is wait, says Rav Cook, and it will be okay. <laughs> and then he says, and in addition, he says, the Rambam tells us that when you talk, read about the creation in Maseh Bereshit, you have to know that some of it is a metaphor, some of it is a fact. So Rav Cook is disturbed that there are people that are disturbed, and I think that's a very healthy approach uh, to look at it in general. But when you talk about scientific findings, is it something <coughs> that will it bother you at all if you come from a very rational school? Uh, it's going to cause things to you know, develop in your mind. Questions will arise. You're going to have to deal with it. On the other hand, if you come from this complete school of faith, and nothing is going to bother you at all. So there are clearly different uh, schools. You talk about the Messianic era. Right? The Messianic era. 
how do you view the messianic era? Is it an era uh, where there are going to be gigantic fruits and everyone's going to be uh, in bliss and the weather's always going to be perfect and we're going to live forever ever? Or is the messianic era an era <coughs> when we return to the land of Israel? We're going to have a ruler, but olam keminagon nohek, but the world will continue functioning more or less as we know it with some significant improvements. So your rational school versus the faith school, and again, they're both based on great rabbinic authorities, Maimonides versus Nachmanides. So what we're going to do, to start off, I'm going to quote to you a Midrash, that the Midrash shares with us some more information about Pharaoh's reaction to Moshe's appearance and him with Aaron performing this incredible miracle, this ability to go ahead and take a staff and make it into a tanin. Okay? So there's an interesting Midrash. So the Midrash tells us that when Moshe Rabbeinu makes his appearance, it's an old Midrash, he burst out laughing. This is Pharaoh's reaction. And he said to them, this is what you do. To go ahead and bring merchandise to where it is produced. In other words, it's in, we're, we're in Egypt. Hello, we all could do that, right? Black magic, I mean, or witchcraft, or the ability to create things. Magicians, that's we're the hub, right? We're we're the center. We're the Amazon, right? Uh, of of such creations. And he says to them, according to the midrash. Do you go, Murias was some kind of fish dip that came from Spain. So do you go ahead and when you produce it, you bring it to Spain where it's produced? That's absurd. Coles to Newcastle. Coles Newcastle, correct. Okay, very nice. Do you go ahead and bring fish to Ako? You don't bring fish to Ako. You bring fish from Ako. Paro says to them, don't you know that I'm, I'm in complete control of all of that. So what does he do? Miad shalach. So Pharaoh, the Midrash tells us, sent out vehevi tinokot min iskuli. He brought tinokot, children, from the iskuli. What's the iskuli? The school. In Greek, the word skole is a school, a escuela, for those of you who... You know, or in South America, escuela is a school, right? He brought kids from the Iskuli. Ve'asu afhemkach. And they even, in other words, they got chinech from a very young age in Egypt. Right? He had a whole government-sponsored school. Right? This is Egypt. It's like North Korea. That when you visit Pyongyang, it would be very fancy and very nice. But if you would go out, they won't allow you, they'll kill you. But if you would go out, you know, 20 kilometers in any direction, you'll see people starving to death. Why? The government is going to go ahead and do, develop <coughs> schools and institutions that will benefit the government, or a city that benefits the government to show the world. So here too, you have a school, government-sponsored school, and teachers couldn't strike there, right? Because you, would, you, would, you wouldn't be around the next day, you would be a mummy. So therefore, in the school itself, they got training, v'asu afhem kach. Okay? What does the Midrash tell us? That magic and supernatural abilities, they had it in Egypt from a very, very young age. What do you say, Josh? So Moshe grew up in the house of Paro. Uh -huh. He must have known this. Correct. In other words, he must have known. He went to school there. He, right. He must have known what was going on, that these children could do it. So what was the big deal of him doing it? Okay. Why do you start with that instead of the fifth one? Yeah. So I, I, I think that the fact that Aaron's mate swallowed theirs was an indication that this is different. Yeah, and it could be... But he didn't like, know that before. Well, Pharaoh didn't know it. Mm -hmm. But the, Pharaoh's whole lecture here, his whole talk, is before Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron are able to up it. And there's a Rabbeinu Nisim, one of the authorities notes that the reason they came, that they were, did it in Egypt is if they would be doing it anywhere else, if these events and miracles would occur anywhere else, they would say, okay, maybe they have some kind of uh, abilities that he picked up in Egypt. But now that in Egypt itself he was able to do things that the Khartoumim eventually say, Etzba Elokimi, 
that was an indication that it was a different type of magic. So again, Moshe was familiar, and he very much was expecting this. But then the next step, the swallowing and the rest of the makot, is really what clinched it. Did he do this to build up to the espa? He did this to build up. It was a build up. Correct. Good. Good. That's that's the approach. That's the approach that uh, that we take about it. So clearly, this magic really works. Isn't that what the midrash seems to tell us? And when you read Rashi, by the way, on Chumash, and Rashi tells us that there are two types of systems that were used by the necromancers there. One was Bilatehem, and one was Bilahatehem. And one of them was using demons, that the Egyptians had control over the demons, and one system was control over some kind of angels or kshafim, that, in other words, systems that actually they could tap into the supernatural. Now re- listen to that carefully, <coughs> that we could tap into the supernatural because we're connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They too could tap into the supernatural, meaning that these kshafim, that these wonders, actually have power to override nature. Okay? That's how it seems to be from many authorities. Okay? How does it work? Why did God Almighty allow such a thing to happen? He gave them a nevuah also. Uh, he gave nevuah to Bilam, and it could be that the way the system works is that God created things in the world to connect, to be a, the ability to connect to the supernatural, but there's a balance. There's the good side of it, and then the dark side of it, right? So some kind of balance that exists in this force. That's how you have to uh, relate to it if you take that approach. Who doesn't agree with this approach that has been spelled out up until now? <coughs> Who doesn't agree with this approach that actually the kishuf, you know, the Torah prohibits us from doing magic. You know that. You know that do magic. Mm-hmm. So the simple understanding would be that these forces do exist. I actually could utter words that will control, that were super, will somehow supersede nature, and as a result of that, I could do things that will blow your mind away. They have these things. They have these mind readers. These uh, they're very popular now. To believe that even in Jewish organizations, I have to bring them in is mind-boggling. Momentalist stupidity. <laughs> that you have a Pesach hotel, glad kosher, right? Glad kosher, no gebrox, 24-hour coffee, and a mentalist. Like it's very, very, very and a shiurim in a base manager open 24 hours next to the coffee room. So, so the one is entertainment, right? One's entertainment, mentalist. But yeah. really, in other words, is that is that a Jewish way of entertaining? I don't know. If you I don't realize know. It's just, it's what was real. that? Is that intellectual? If you realize it's not real. If you realize it's not real. So I mean, okay. So you know, there are questions that were asked to Ramosh and great rabbis about doing it for kids. But it's interesting that when adults need it as well, like, how did he know it? You know, like, how did he know that my former boyfriend was uh, Jerry? How did he know that? And then they realized that you had everything on Facebook. All he did was, <laughs> was he identified a person and read everything because you're a fool that you read everything about your life online and you read it and that's how he knew. Anyway, that, that aside, that aside. But these things do work according to what we are saying now, the Midrash, Rashi, according to many of the readings of the rabbis, that there is, and therefore when the Torah warns us not to do kishuf, not to go ahead and perform magic, it is because it actually works. And don't go there. Don't go there. Right? And Kabbalistic things, you've heard stories of Kabbalists who could do all kinds of supernatural things. Right? It, it's, it, it works really. It works really. Maybe you should do it. Maybe you shouldn't do it. That's all one school. But welcome to another school. For those who are not comfortable with school A, there's the school of Maimonides. Uh, the Rambam, you know it. It's the Rambam, the Rambam. And the Rambam, after, he makes, he, he states this several places, but when it comes to the laws of Avodah Zarah and the prohibition of performing magic. So the Rambam uh, uses the words that you should know. The Torah prohibits it, even though it is only believed by ignorant and foolish people. Because all they have the ability is to, they have these fine motor skills, and it is the sleight of hand, right? With, with cards, right? You know, I was Ari, which one of your kids are very good with it. That it's a fast hand, at least I hope so, right? Unless he can tune it, <laughs> sleight of hand. Sleight of hand, so that's how Maimonides reads it all. That's how Maimonides, and that's a different school that exists. Fine? So sometimes, like for example, 
you, you look at uh, the, the art scroll, the art scroll Chumash, and on the bottom they have a section about magic. So he, he <coughs> just quotes the Rambam, who maintains that all magic, even that discussed in scripture, is sleight of hand, and on that only foolish and ignorant people believe it. Now, he says, the other classic commentators, however, based on proofs from the Talmud, dispute this. According to them, they maintain that it was real. So art scroll spells out both. Fine? So far, so good? Now, uh, there was a, a, one of the greatest rabbis of the 19th century. Really, one of the greatest was a rabbi by, we call him the Malbim, the Malbim. His name was Rabbi Meir Leibush Weiser. Rabbi Meir Leibush Weiser. In some uh, sources, the last name was Malbin, with an N at the end. Fine. Uh, he was a rabbi over 40 years in seven, seven different communities. He was a tremendous Which Torah country? scholar. And when he wrote on Shulchan Aruch, Which? he wrote... Which country? Uh, well, he was in Bucharest, he was, he was in, 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 in Romania, obviously in Germany sometime, and then in Lithuania. He made his rounds in Poland as well. He made his rounds. Uh, Bucharest is the, pin, is the city that they mentioned, they, they associate him often uh, with, because it was a large community and he had a lot of a big, uh, significant say there. And his scholarship was recognized in all areas of Jewish law. For example, he wrote on Shulchan Aruch, but he only wrote on the beginning, on the first, I think it was like 25 to 30 uh, sec, uh, seifim, par, um, chapters of Shulchan Aruch. And it was so thorough that some rabbis afterwards noted that they are grateful to the Almighty that he did not write on everything because they wouldn't have left anything for anyone else to add. Because he had such... And even though he had, like later on, in the, in decades later, when the Chofetz Chaim wrote on Shulchan Aruch, he quoted him hundreds of times, even though he only wrote on one section, the Arsus HaChaim is quoted right, right and left, thorough, complete. He also had great knowledge of Tanakh, and he wrote on all of Tanakh. And what he wrote on Tanakh was really uh, to combat those who believed or tried to view Tanakh as perhaps written randomly, with, written by prophets who are not in complete control of language, and therefore they repeat themselves. So Malbim says, nope, that's not the case. If you read it carefully, every variation is to teach you something. And therefore he had complete precision with e a precise understanding of every single word. And therefore, don't think that David Amelech repeated himself, but rather he's making another, getting across another message. And he had this ability to remember every single word and what it indicates. It's one of the most significant, if not the most significant texts to study Tanakh is indeed the Malbim, tremendous scholar. He had a deep appreciation for the Hebrew language, which was not common among rabbis. But as a result of that, he had some tsaris. He had some tsaris. When he was a rabbi in, in Bucharest, he immediately, now when he was welcomed into town, uh, the, the maskilim, uh, those who were trying to make adjustments uh, to Jewish tradition, in the beginning they welcomed him. Because he seemed more modern, he knew Tanakh, right? he spoke, he understood Hebrew very well. They f thought that they're welcoming someone that's going to be a little bit more flexible, but the, it was not the case. He was very demanding of the shochtim, for example, that they showed their knife to him and they wanted to take control. And his journey and uh, position as a rabbi was one of great challenge for him. He himself uh, this writes, and this is from the Levanon, from one of these publications that appeared in 1865, an actual photocopy of it. He shares how eventually some powerful uh, uh, lay leaders of the community decided that it was time to get rid of the rabbi, right? So they didn't give him two weeks notice. But rather he writes, it's Basiri Lachodesh Adar, it was the 10th of Adar Shani, and the year was Tafresh Chav Dalet, 1864, and it was Erev Shabbat Zachor, Be'erev Shabbat Shekorimbo Zachor et Asher Asalach Amalek. In other words, he's yeah. referring to, we always are fighting Amalek. Be'erev Shabbat Baboker, Ba'al Beti Ha'apolisi Asaviv Saviv. 
they, they surrounded his house and they kicked him out. They put him on a wagon and they took him to the border with Turkey and they just dumped him there and said, you're not, no longer welcome in Romania. Right. That's how the community treated him. What? They're all there. He had a Shrek Lecha journey throughout uh, the rabbinate, there was, and, but he was extremely respected. There was even an attempt to bring him to New York to become the chief rabbi uh, of New York. And eventually, at age 69, I think there was a position offered for him somewhere in Europe that would be calmer, but he had a heart attack and he passed away at age 69. That's, that's the Malbim. Now, among his Soros, by the way, among his Soros was the fact that after Bucharest, he landed up in a city by the name of Lunchitz in Poland. Lunchitz. And in Lunchitz, there, it was a smaller community. This was, um, I don't know where in number within the seven that he went through. The Hasidim were not happy with him. Meaning, he first had Saras from those who were too, were, he, wasn't, he wasn't liberal enough. And then he comes to a community and he wasn't from enough for the Hasidim, and they caused him Tsaris and, and Yeta. And they note that one of the issues they had was what, with his writings on Chumash, that it wasn't Hasidic enough for them. And again, we're not talking about high-end Hasidim, we're talking about uh, the low end of, that every civilization creates. And they caused him Tsaris, right? So sometimes, you know, what exactly can Hasidim not like about what Malbim wrote? So this is what. I try to keep my eyes open because I like everything he writes, right? But I want to identify it what others don't. So remember this midrash. Remember this midrash of the ch of the school. So up until now, the was was a school. <laughs> I like that low end Hasidim. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, it wasn't a, a real, you know, God fearing, smart rabbi, right? It wasn't a Tversky. It was some person that they, you know that follow their team like a sports team, like right. Liverpool fans. In other words, just as the Gunshevelt <laughs> has football teams to go or soccer teams, and they go, so too in the Jewish world you have those that get into a fight not because they're interested in the truth. They want action. Yeah. So if they go go ahead and protest, it's their soccer, like in Israel. Like yeah. why is it that they could get out for a uh, Afghana people, right? So there are here and there those that actually people that feel that the great rabbi must. Uh, you know, is concerned about Chil Shabbos, and there are those who say, oh good, finally, something more entertaining that doesn't cost money that we can't afford because we don't have an education. So they go out, and what do they do? They go into to protest. So that's what I call low-end people that are not using what HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, this seichel that they're supposed to use. So that's, because I don't want to go ahead and say that Chassidim were against the Malbim. They're wonderful people, and the Malbim was, uh, was a great rabbi. So that's how I try to. So now, <laughs> With, um, remember the Medrash, remember the Medrash that they went to school? What did they study in school according to our reading of the Medrash? Magic. 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 Yeah. Schools of magic, right? Like in Harry Potter, no? Didn't, isn't that, yeah. Did they learn magic there? Sorcery. Sorcery. There's a big to do. I remember when the kids, yes, to read Harry Potter, not read Harry Potter. <laughs> By the time we went, went back and forth, it. my kids read it already three times. <laughs> <laughs> that that, yeah, because it would come, and you know, it was a big, it was a big Harry, they knew Harry Potter, that generation, the Ian. I'm sure they should. Now, so that, the Malbim takes a little bit of a different approach. Because the Malbim is a rationalist. And he takes the approach of the Rambam, of Maimonides. And he believes that these Egyptians couldn't do anything. And by the way, there's an opinion in the Talmud that says that. People think that Rambam made it up. That's not true. When there's a discussion in the Talmud of the abilities that these magicians and necromancers have, comes Rav Papa, and Rav Papa says they can't create anything. Meaning one of the rabbis says, they could create, but it has to be larger than the size of barley, in other words. And comes Rav Papa and says, they can't create anything. What are you drawing a cup? They have the ability to bring it from other places. That's what Rav Papa says. So it's not like the Rambam came up with it. Obviously, this is an old, an old school. Malbim reads this Midrash and tells us you have to know how to read this Midrash. And he says the following. Okay, so remember the Midrash. The Midrash tells us that Pharaoh sent the kids to the, he brought kids from the Iskuli. The Asu Hafhem Kach. Asu Hafhem Kach. They also did it. 
says Malbim. Ratzal Omar, you know what they did? There were indeed crocodiles moving around in the palace. Meaning after Moshe performed what he did, the Egyptians performed. And these crocodiles were there. And what happened was, says Malbim, these Egyptian wise men and necromancers threw down their staffs and they were <coughs> swallowed by these serpents, these crocodiles that made an appearance. And in his words, Shetachat Orat Aninim, Hitatfu Tinokot, meaning there was a training in school. The training was that they had these kids who would learn to get dressed up or to put upon themselves these hides of crocodiles mm. and to move around like crocodiles mm. and to somehow do things in a very fast way that they could fool the observer to believe that they suddenly appeared out of nothing. Okay? So therefore, and they got training for it. Hamelumadim ba'askuela. The training in school, they had different courses, right? That course is how to make it appear that you suddenly appear. How to go ahead and turn yourself from a staff into a crocodile. Mm -hmm. So this was part of their training. And the way he describes it, when like in the, in the Star Wars they had in one of them these little creatures that looked like teddy bears running around that they had to get kids or dwarfs. Uh, to put on, uh, not in your, not, not your, not, no one, no one here. So, <laughs> generation. So they had to, so, it, they, what they do is little like Ewoks or something. Ewoks. Ewoks. You see, so we do more question, educate them. So you have these little Ewoks that were children that got training. They obviously had to teach the kids and they had their own escuela. So here too, the training was, the way the Malbim views it, is that they had from perhaps some kind of curtain. And the Egyptian throws down his staff. And suddenly, from the curtain, with great speed, the child, wearing the costume of a crocodile, because he has an actual, probably an actual crocodile uh, hide, uh, right? It's on the bottom, Kate Spade, probably, or something. And he jumps out, jumps out from behind the curtain, swallows the staff. And what does it appear like? Hey, the staff just turned into a crocodile, they could do it as well. The children were learned, they had, you know, the ballet lesson to go ahead and figure out how to dance like a crocodile. crocodile. And therefore he says, kelahat is like, like lightning. In other words, the words that were used, that Rashi tells you that they refer to supernatural control, Malvim says, no, it means that it was with great speed, sleight of hand. That is how the Malbim reads this section. And this has had a significant impact to the two schools, right? To the two schools. While, while you read it, and the traditional way is, yeah, they had some abilities. You turn to Rambam, you turn to Malbim, or in their reading of the Midrash, it's not the case. So this is important information to even start uh, this process of what's happening in Egypt. Now, the, the difference between the rational school and the school of faith makes its appearance also, for example, do we take wisdom from the world around us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Do you take Goyesha wisdom as wisdom? Mm -hmm. Or if, because it does not originate from holy sources, it should be rejected. Mm -hmm. So if you come from the school of complete faith, the attitude in general is a complete rejection. If you take the school of rational thinking, uh, they realize that if there's a contribution, and they quote the rabbis, call Haomer Dvar Chochma Filu Munaf Ma'umot Aulam, that even if it originates from the nations of the world, they can make a contribution. I always point to this book as the greatest proof that great rabbis indeed have turned to wisdom from other nations. And what, what am I referring to? This is a book called Cheshbon Hanefesh. It was printed in the 1840s, written earlier by a Menachem Yehuda Leib Lepin, who was a, a, a scholar who focused on self-development. And in his work, he notes that he found from external sources a system 
that you find that you identify 13 attributes that you have to work on, and every week you work on one of those attributes and those personality traits. So then, after a year, you've gone through it four times and you become a better person. And he actually goes through these attributes, which include menucha, savlanut, seder, order, haritzut, nekiyut, anavat, sedek. These are all good attributes. Zrizut, to do things with enthusiasm. Shtika, which is something that the world would be a much better place <laughs> if there would be more of it, right? Emet, prishut. So this is a very inspiring text that when Rabbi Sharl Salan sees it a few decades after the passing of the author, he says this got to be republished. This is the text that we should be using. And this is really the foundation of the Musra movement, this Cheshbon HaNefesh. Now, the author himself, right, the author himself, where did he get it from? He got it from a book that lists these 13, 13 attributes, temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, by Benjamin Franklin. So it originates, so the Muster movement finds its roots in the writings. Benjamin Franklin was a person that worked on himself. He focused on these ideas, right? He, he, he is one. So the Muster movement has roots in Benjamin Franklin, who was not a yeshiva student, right? So. How do I approach such a thing? To some, if you would mention what is mentioned here, they will be shocked. How, do you, how, how is it possible that such a holy thing that makes and that had an impact on yeshivot could originate from a Goyesha place? If you take the school that, you know what, we have to develop ourselves, we have to use rational thinking. If a contribution comes from such a source, yes. that is something we should go ahead and deal with. So it's that's available in English, by the way. They, they read the printing. It's, it's an excellent... On, on Amazon. On, Am on Amazon. That's a very short. Okay. Excellent. Now, let's do a little bit something. Let's, uh, let's, let's do a little bit. Turn to page 336 to, just to conclude with something, uh, with one other thing. Good. That's good. That's fine. Let's do break to catch up. Okay. So... Very good. See you later. Uh, the hail, you're, you're familiar with, uh, with the hail? Hail? Mm -hmm. I say hail, hail. The last in this week's parsha, the hail. Not, okay, the hail. So page 336. It was a bad, it was a bad plague, the hail. What was that? Yeah. Snail, the hail. Okay. Hail. And th this was, it was a bad plague. It was a bad plague. Verse 31 on page 338, okay? This is like the end of the Parsha. And it's talking about, uh, you know, that this was a bad plague. It impacted, uh, the, the impacted, impacted Egypt. And then there's a fascinating verse, fascinating verse, which on the surface you ask yourself, what is it doing there? So let's read slowly verse 31. What's verse 31? <coughs> yeah, on page 338. What happened? Hapishta. <laughs> This is just information that you should know what this is describing the impact of the hail. That the pishta vaseora, when it comes to the flax on the barley, they were struck. Nukata. Why? Why were they struck? Because they show up early. They grow early. When you grow early, poof, comes the hail, you're gone. Kiaseora, because the barley was ripe. The pishta, and the flax already was in its stock. On the other hand, when it comes in verse 32, we are told that chitab, kusemet, wheat, and spelt were not struck. Why? Ki afilot henna, they show up later. <coughs> what, 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 in what way does this information help us? Just some facts that what survived the, 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 the plague and what did not? No? Any thoughts? Okay, so what we're, we're going to do is the following. Often in life, often in life, people uh, develop dreams, right? Dreams. And quite often, these dreams of how things should be uh, don't come about. Right, and there's a, a, it's a, an adjustment I heard on the radio not long ago that 
they actually have identified the lowest point in a person's life when it comes to how they feel about life, and it's age 47. Yeah. You've heard that. Yeah. Now, actually, today is called Blue Monday. Blue, Blue Monday, like it's the most depressing. So imagine if you're 47 today. How do you feel, right? This is a very depressing state, right? Okay, so now, why is it that sometimes at age 47, because, you know, you're, you know, a person's young and they have all kind of dreams, they're going to be successful, travel the world, do all kind of incredible things, and then reality adds up. So they, okay, and there's a denial, and there's some, like, Oh boy, th this is life. There's an acceptance of life. And then there's a maturity that occurs, okay? Now, when a person allows ideals to be based on human desire, on primitive elements, expect disappointment. Because life has surprises. Fact. Expect disappointment. If, on the other hand, we, we develop dreams and goals based on something more mature, right? something spiritual, and we work on it and we have faith, we could really have a very fulfilling life because circumstances cannot impact them. When I have a goal, when I have a goal that I want to focus in prayer more, I want to be kinder to others, I want to be more careful with what I say, I want to have a more ap better attitude of appreciation. If that's my goal, I'm actually in control of that. And if I'm in control of that and I fulfill it, life could be very, very good. And it is good because where I have control, I do what I should be doing. Okay? That's a fact I think we're all aware of. Now, in our tradition, in our tradition, we look at the grains and we consider barley a primitive grain, animal feed. Uh, when the Torah talks about the, the sota, so it's a gift of barley. When the Torah wants to tell us that the people of Israel matured from the Exodus until Kabbalat Torah, so two offerings are brought, one in the beginning of that journey of counting and one at the end of that journey. In the beginning of that journey, when we are not yet sophisticated yeah. beings, before we allow Torah values to impact who we are, we bring an offering of barley on Pesach, on the second day of Pesach. When we've reached maturity through that journey, what do we bring? Wheat. Wheat. And by the way, the Talmud tells us that spelt is a subcategory of wheat. Okay, just have that information that you like, I like spelt as an enjoyable, it's a subcategory of wheat. Okay? Now, Egypt, in their society, Egypt was a society that they dressed themselves with linen. If you were wealthy in Egypt, you had thin linen. If you were poor, you had coarse linen. That's what they wore. And the people of Israel, by the way, throughout the years in the wilderness, those that would slip spiritually, they would dream of the good old days in Egypt. You know what they actually desired? Oh, I, 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 I miss those good old Egyptian linen garments, right? The Talmud shares with us a story that when they were almost entering into the land of Israel and they were enticed, remember, by the daughters of, uh, of Moab there? So how did they attract the Jewish young men? What was the first thing that they put on the front? So part of their plan was to entice the Jew Jewish men by selling linen garments to them. Because in the words of the Talmud, the Jews are mit avim. They have a desire, a deep desire, the clay pishtan. So if you want to talk about an Egyptian garment, that symbolizes a, a very primitive being and primitive dreams and where we have to distance ourselves. And the Yitziat Mitzrayim that we talk about is leaving such attitudes, barley and linen symbolize those things. And they symbolize ideals that mature early but then are destroyed. On the other hand, <coughs> ideals that are based on development, right? The wheat ideals are the ones that last. So now let's look again at verse 31 and 32. So the message here is that vehapishta veasora. When it comes to flax and barley, what happened to them? They're struck. Ideals that are primitive. I want to. I want to. You know. I want to go ahead for the child to be a fireman. For one, it is to be wealthy and to have a, 
a, a Ferrari and to go ahead and have a, you know, they're advertising everywhere a boat show in Toronto. You've heard they're advertising mm -hmm. about boat, you know, so among, among some, having a long yacht is considered like a, a <laughs> success. You're somebody if you have a long yeah, really? You think that the person with the long, you know, with how many, how many feet is it supposed to be here? Many. Many, many. <laughs> is that really the answer to that? If that's success, believe, I have a hard time believing that those are the people that are really calm and happy because the person with the 75 meter yacht is looking at someone that has one that has a 105 meter yacht. So those are ideals <laughs> that what's going to happen to your flax and primitive barley, they're going to be struck. They're not going to last. On the other hand, and this is a message for Cloud Israel, if you are going to be building and determining what your, your life is about, ideals that come about due to maturity, your wheat and spelt, they ripen later, but they're going to withstand the challenge. So that's perhaps a little bit of an insight into the message that's here. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you for Amazing. coming next week. There's no class. Okay, I think we sent, there's no class, but we sent that email, did you get the yeah, email, okay? Yeah, yeah. But we see you again, Parashat Bishalach. Thank you, everyone, again.